I think we can start. <laughs> it is my honor to welcome you at our first keynote session today. Finally, the keynotes can speak for themselves, not just uh, listen to everybody else. And uh, today we have two duos, uh, <laughs> but not really a duo, just a dialogue between uh, people coming from north, south, east, no, east, east was us, but uh, west as well. And so uh, that was our idea to do this uh, this way. And uh, yeah, and I will introduce our guests. Um, first we got Jackka, uh, which was, uh, I, I can read the bio, but you can read it for yourself. But basically she was one of the biggest inspirations and authorities for conducting our research. So uh, it's a sour real privilege that you can be here with us and, and we can talk in this lovely venue. Uh, Jackie is working on the area of parenthood, intimacy and sexuality in families uh, and most recent long term was uh, couple relationships, so coming back to the heterosexual world, but uh, uh, she's one of the most important researchers in the area. And uh, Ruth Kresser is an uh, affiliated fellow from UC Berlin. Uh, and teaching fellow in the University of Haifa and feminist activist, which is great um, to have it all. And uh, I met uh, Ruth in Lisbon, uh, it was last year, I think, and uh, it was one of the most uh, amazing, you know, inspiring presentations I heard there uh, about queer separation, sexuality, belonging. And that's why we want to invite you and create the space of dialogue. So that's why we are here, just to talk and to let you, you know, hear your voices and, and yeah, that's, that's the idea. So I will just give you the floor. Cool. Okay, well thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm, I'm sort of honoured and humbled, etc. Um, and for your, your talk yesterday, I think all of us are still in shock um, at just how much you, you've achieved in such a relatively short space of time. And in a way, what's interesting is today's talk is going to actually take the long view, and I'm, I'm looking over 25 years. And, and then I start to feel like some dinosaur, but um, we're, we're going to go with this for the moment. <coughs> Because I want to explore advances in equality rights and positive social attitudinal changes. So it's in the UK, so I'm only looking at the, the UK. So how we've experienced um, same-sex parenthood, but also how we understand and make sense of queer kinship. So I think it's time for us to look back as well as forward now. And I'm going to focus on lesbian motherhood in particular because that's where most of my data have been if I look over that 25-year period. So methodological, epistemological and theoretical imperatives are therefore interwoven in the talk today. And I want to reflect on moments where sexuality and relationships become meaningful to open up discussion on where we are and how we got here and to think again about the rights, wrongs and rules of queer kinship. <laughs> so the International Lesbian and Gay Association has identified the UK as the most progressive country in Europe at this current time for LGBT rights. We've actually topped the charts at 86%, which is interesting. Um, and the UK social attitudinal data do indicate a growing tolerance of lesbian and gay relationships. So in this socio-legal context, I want to explore how same-sex parents had shifted over this generation for this 25 years. And I contend that in the analysis of empirical research data, what we've tended to do is to wring out emotions, and I've talked about this before in previous uh, written materials, is in sociology, which is my discipline, my background, my home, disciplinary home, when we write about emotions and family relationships, we tend to make it neat, we tend to take out the messiness of lived lives, we tend to remove ourselves more and more, and especially in the context of our wonderful ref and our policing of our research that we have in the UK. And so we're social theorising, so we're thinking of the likes of Giddens, has, has talked about fateful moments. This is crossroads where something happens. It's like an epiphany. You have a child. Um, well, that's not an epiphany. Um, you have a child or you have a crossroads where something happens thereafter, so you get married. I want to think about moments of, of a small point in time, just something inconsequential, which takes you in a different direction 
Because it's there where you feel the immediacy of relationships. It's often at those small, inconsequential times where the micro and the macro intersect. And I'm influenced very much in that thinking by the, um, by the work of Lisa Bratza at um, Birkbeck, who talked about moments of undoing, and these moments tip us off balance, these small, incisive moments of undoing. I'm going to draw on various different data sets, and the first one um, looks about how they open up meaning-making by placing us in relation to our subjects. So the first set of subjects uh, data are empirical studies that I've completed. The first is sexuality and lesbian parenting. The second was intimacy and sexuality in families. And the most recent is, has been and still is, on long-term adult couple relationships. And they're all ESRC funded, so they've had some sort of uh, state um, support as well, which is interesting. But there's also another source of empirical data. And several people in this room have actually known me this long and know this face. So it's much closer to home, the subject. My embodied emotional and academic interest is both personal and political. And so I want to also draw on anecdotal theorising to use moments from my own experience to situate lesbian motherhood. And I think it's a very important time to do this. So I want to introduce myself in the sense of on the 29th of December, 1990, and you can all start doing maths here, so in 1990, I gave birth to Liam. And he was a baby who was loved, wanted and cherished from the outset by me, who was a lesbian lone mother. So I've therefore lived and loved my field of study, and I'm affected by it, deeply affected by it. And my situation, my personal embodied experience, shapes my understanding. And over the past generation, my adult relationships have gone through various iterations, as some people know, but the constancy is me and Liam. My love for Liam is unreserved, and while I'm not certain what unconditional love is, I think I feel it. But Liam's birth and my entry into the realms of lesbian motherhood is not where the story begins either. I have an ambivalent relationship with ideas of family, I was born in May 63, and you really can do the maths here, so yeah, work it out. <laughs> so I was born in May 63, but if you notice, my, I'm registered at the bottom there in February 1964. And what that shows you is that I'm adopted, and I have no biological connection whatsoever to the man and woman who raised me, cared for me, and loved me unconditionally. They're both my mum and dad, and they're both now sadly deceased. So in the realms of queer kinship, I'm therefore multiply situated, and I decenter biological narratives and I embody them. So I'm on the cultural margins of lots of places. Now, I think as we get older, we, we do biolog uh, 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 biographical stuff, but it isn't self-indulgence or vanity. It really isn't. <laughs> it truthfully isn't. I want to use it because my heritage shapes me, and I want to show how this situated outside-in position renders the familiar strange. Shall we go back to that anthropological sense of ranging the uh, uh, rendering the familiar strange? Because I truthfully remain absolutely confounded by the cultural fascination with blood ties and genetic heritage. I simply don't get it in a visceral sense, in a palpable emotional sense. What on earth is it about? I don't see why you would face trace your family tree. I don't know what a family tree is because I haven't got one. That's by bloodline. And if I did, what the hell would that tell me about me? Because I've never met these people. So that positions me very differently. But when I talk to my parents in the studies, I understand what they're saying. I understand when they say they love their child unconditionally. So I empathise and I'm different. And, and I think that's a, a multiply situated standpoint that is quite interesting. And I think that what that does is enable you to start questioning, taking for granted assumptions and to think about those binaries of inside, outside, hetero, homo, good, bad, and the us and the, and the them. Because I think what they do, and, and it's interesting, JV isn't here, um, but that sort of that idea of invoking the original, uh, you know, the original, the, 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 the something that was there first, that we reflect. And actually, if you come from somewhere, from a different starting point, what's the original? I don't take mothers giving birth as the original. I don't get that. So what if we start from somewhere different where mothers don't give birth? 
It's about being raised. So in terms of empirical data from studies, when I talked to lesbian parents in the first study, their present position was always characterised in relation to the past. So nostalgia, ambivalence, disavowal and distress thus rested uncomfortably alongside each other. And for some in this 80 and 90s period, it, lesbian maternity was precariously positioned. It was in the context of stigmatising cultural attitudes, punitive conservative familial ideology and heteronormative laws. And so we have people like Vicky who really did have to make the either or decision, sexuality or parenthood. And so when I wrote up perverting motherhood at that time, I included Vicky who was a childless mother. She was a mother but she didn't have a child that was with her because she'd had to give her child over without going to court just because she knew she wouldn't win the case. And when she, in the interview, her pain was palpable. There were lots of tears. We've shared tears. And so in this account, blood has little meaning in the sense of she was a mother, but her children didn't live with her. And, and so it starts to unsettle what we think of as, as motherhood. She is a mother, but she doesn't have children. And here what we've got is rather than it being about blood, it was actually socio-legal rights. So it was the courts that reigned supreme in terms of who parented. And then a fond memory for a lot of us in the 80s and 90s, lesbian maternity became riven with contradictions. And so people like Vicky had few choices available to them because of the intersections of sexuality and class. You could tell from her interview there, she did not have choices. She didn't have cultural capital. She didn't have money to go to court and fight with the potential of winning. But for those who had greater social capital, the impact of sexuality, rights and wrongs created a very different experience. So the, the Section 28 and the Stop the Clause campaign actually gave possibilities, it gave opportunities, it gave choice, because there were cultural narratives that were being created. And so for some parents, the opportunities that came out seemed absolutely of a different era to those of Vicky. And cultural resources afforded them choices that they could craft a different story where they actually saw themselves as a vanguard of possibility. So here we have Charlotte and Penny. <laughs> they saw themselves as the first generation to have children openly together as a couple. So they, they conceived as a couple, as a lesbian couple. And they turned the Section 28 debate on its head and talked about their pretended family in a real way. Of They owned the debate. They took it on. It was their time. They challenged things. And so through Section 28, there was a sense that the campaign fostered community through our collective outrage, and it positioned same-sex parenthood as, a, as something that could be achieved. It showed you how to do it. There were kits. You could sort of learn about things. <coughs> and so that was quite interesting as a time. And, and at, at this point, in the Ferrari around Section 28, Myself, with badges on my lapels and placards raised high, I embarked on lesbian motherhood with zeal and overriding optimism. But owning our pretended families did not straightforwardly create a happy ever after future. <coughs> While same-sex parenthood was beginning to carve out a cultural space, we were not always welcome at the party. So let's take a moment. Pride in the park. A lovely afternoon chatting and laughing with friends, old and new, Liam, in his element, enjoys the attention of well-wishers who compliment his dancing and request pictures of this funky little chap. Smiling and content, I push his buggy across the park. A young man approaches me. I smile. He says, do you think this is an appropriate place for a child? His stinging remark, deftly aimed, was designed to let me know that he was the responsible parent I was the, he was the responsible adult, I was the irresponsible parent. Parent and child were misplaced. And as time passes, I've rehearsed my retort and you think, oh, I wish I'd said, you know how you do when you go to bed and you think, if only I'd have said this, and you can think of some clever kind of uh, riposte to the, the comment. And I understand where the comment came from. In an era dominated by media hysteria around HIV and, and AIDS, this young man's desire to protect social spaces is understandable, but the comment still smarts. It still smarts today. 
And I should say I shared the paper, this paper with Liam, who came to visit me in Verona, where I'm staying at the moment, with Federica and Chiara. Um, and it was interesting to share with your son, who's now an adult, these moments, to see this was part of his life. So I've shared it with him too. And it shows you that at this time, we're mixing together legislation and biographies in particular ways. Because actually, underlying all of this, there's a resilient context, which is the meanings of blood, genes, and the reproductive narrative. And that they're differently experienced. They may be all or nothing, but they are hugely, they are hugely significant. So when mothers in the perverting motherhood and the behind closed door studies talked about their sexual and maternal identities, they were sometimes very hard to reconcile. And this idea of the best interest of the child, which we hear about today, actually came in very stark ways. So here we have Astrid talking about her decision to marry the biological father of her child. It seems quite hard to imagine in the UK when you say these things. This is not very long ago. Okay? This, is, this, is, you know, this really is not very long ago. And she made that decision because in her reasoning, there was a mediated love because they created a child, their genes, biology, all of that stuff came together to make this baby. Therefore, she must love him. The love was mediated. And in the best interest of the child, she decided to marry. And it's also because there, there were um, issues of um, ethnicity in the sense that the child had um, dual heritage and therefore she lived in a very conservative area and she wanted to give that child access to both um, sets of experience and um, cultural heritage. So her, her sacrifice is indeed significant. So when she says she's going to give up her life for a child, well, she, she pretty much gave up a big chunk of it, deciding not to be a lesbian. So times and attitudes have moved on, but which relationships really count? So another moment I'd like to take here is with Liam. And I arrived to pick him up. This is in the um, 2000s. So this is about... 2000 and yeah 2000 2000 2001 and I arrived to pick Liam up from school age 10 and I'm met by his new teacher she says can we have a word I'm sorry I'm worried Liam will be upset she goes on to describe the afternoon lesson during which the children were asked to draw family trees she notices that Liam is sitting quietly at his desk not drawing she asks him what's the matter nothing I finished but there's only two people on here that's because there's only me and my mum. Deftly sidestepping the father issue because she knows I'm a lesbian, she continues, what about grandparents? Liam duly explained that his nanny had recently died, he's very matter of fact, but she couldn't be part of his family tree because I was adopted, therefore there no, were no blood relatives apart from him and me, so he reasoned he drew a family twig. <laughs> the mortified teacher inquired, <laughs> she, was, she was crying, sorry when I saw her, she was crying. The mortified teacher inquired whether there were other people in his family. He stated that of course there were, and that it's just that by her instructions they didn't count because there were no bloodlines. She suggested that he include everyone he loved. Showing me his picture, she likened it to a woodland. All kith and kin were depicted, including our three dogs, three goldfish, numerous friends and relatives. <laughs> the family tree had blossomed. So the lesson had been learnt by both Liam and the teacher, and the salience of cells and plasma and the cultural meanings afforded to these had been unsettled. But the course of bloodline narrative is not always so readily diverted as Claire, birth mother of three boys, demonstrates about the same time as she explained why she keeps her parental and partner relationships separate. They're two different relationships. She has one with her boys, her boys. She talks about her boys a lot in other places. Whereas when they're all together, it's natural, as calm and polite as it could be with her partner, but it's not a recreation of family. So she sees family as something quite distinct. And so for Claire then, very much, there was a sense that blood was thicker than water. And she has that kind of recourse to the natural discourses that debar her from creating, recreating family. And so like Vicky, her horizons were contained by biographical and social cultural resources. So this is another mother who was um, not of higher education, who had <coughs> few um, access, uh, little access to um, cultural capital that may have taken her to somewhere like Penny and Charlotte. But there's also other less palatable imperatives that inform her framing of family. 
And at this time, radical lesbian rhetoric adversely impacted on the experience and understandings of maternity. In the 80s and early 90s, the derogatory term breeder remained common currency. Lesbian mothers' efforts to realise a different type of child rearing were seen as futile. And in 1991, in one book, it was written, no matter what you do, if you have a boy, he will terrorise and attack girls and later adult women, and statistically, will very likely to be a rapist. <laughs> 1991. <coughs> okay. So while six sentiments represented a minority opinion, even at that time, and one that seems completely far-fetched and alien today, in queer communities of today and in heteronormative communities of today, lesbian mothers during this time often knew these narratives. We grew up with them. Some of us were part of lesbian radical sexism. So in the 1990s, it was still common for lesbian mothers with sons to be denied access to women's events, such as Lesi Camp and Dykes on Hikes. I was told when Liam was three, I couldn't take him on a walk, because presumably he'd do something. I could take my male dog, but I couldn't take Liam. And it's therefore surprising, un it's therefore perhaps unsurprising in the perverting motherhood study that many distanced themselves from lesbian community. And they actually called les the scene scary and full of different weird people. And they, they just didn't get the scene because it was something separate, perhaps separatist. So Claire's desire to keep her boys and her sexuality separate may be more understandable, perhaps, in that context. Being a mother of male children was not always easy, and prejudice is not the prerogative of patriarchy. So let's take another moment, circa 2002-03. <clears throat> My partner and I were invited to a party at a friend's house. New to the area, which is renowned for being lesbian friendly, and I openly say this is Hebden Bridge for anyone from the UK. This is meant to be the sort of the, the um, mecca of um, gay friendly. And I'm full of optimism. A couple of drinks consumed in conversations on parenthood emerge, so I readily join in saying, my little one loves doing that too. And I don't quite remember what the, the thing was that he liked doing. And this woman said, oh, you have a child, how old? He's 10. You've got a boy. Bad luck. Did you not douche with vinegar after inseminating? It's a good way of getting rid of male sperm. <laughs> I'm dumbfounded, lost for words. I'm guessing I mumbled a reply. I, <laughs> I don't know quite what it was. I know what it would be now, but I don't know what it was then. I can't recall. And notwithstanding the ludicrous suggestion that this would actually work, the comment still stings, and again, we're misplaced. So this is only just 10 years ago, a bit, bit over 10 years ago. And then we go today, so I've skipped for time. You're glad to know. <laughs> the legitimacy of queer parental possibility and the different forms this may take seem far removed from such rhetoric and reasoning. And there are undoubtedly more choices available and queer kin diversity reflects every hue of the family rainbow. But rights and liberal rules do not equate with limitless choice. Decisions still typically seg into understandings of the best choice. And today in the UK, this typically translates into settling down, committing to a partner for the long term through civil partnership and now same-sex marriage. So in the recent interviews for the Enduring Love Project, Legal opportunities were routinely included in queer life trajectories as part of the relationship horizon. And these state-sanctioned unions were not only public, symbolic displays of the lesbian and gay happy couple, they were also held up as an exemplar. So here we have Charlotte again talking about their civil partnership. So it's great that the kids did reading, and I'm sure it was indeed moving, and I'm really not in any way dismissing what Charlotte said. But it's interesting how she characterises this relationship now is a good model to go forward because it shows they're in a happy, stable relationship and that's a good example for their children. And in interviews with young queers, and, and Danny Pearson um, <laughs> um, talked about this yesterday, Danny was one of the researchers on the Enduring Love Project. When we talk to young queers about their long-term relationships, they often imagined a relationship horizon that they didn't often, they all included 
ideas of civil partnership or marriage, and certainly whether they would or would not have children. And so for Leanne and Chloe here, the issue wasn't how would they live in such a radical way? It was actually, would they get a dog or a child? And they decided <laughs> um, it, it's about taking a, a child and a dog on a plane. So we talked about getting a dog, but it, a dog is like a big commitment, like a child, really. The only difference is that you can't take a dog on a plane. So have a child because you can take them on a plane. And, um, and, and, and <laughs> children grow up, whereas a dog, it's always dependent on you. <laughs> Okay, as opposed to children. So it's like having a child, a baby, forever. So be warned if you have a dog. Um, but where does this take queer kinship? You know, leaving aside flippancy. So young queers have grown up in the 21st century in the UK knowing same-sex marriage and potential parenthood was their right. And for most, it was part of their plans at some, shape and, uh, some point in time, some shape and form. So whilst early understandings of family we choose, think of Western and all of that work, represented a counter-discourse, where elective ties were championed as evidence of the cultural artifice of blood ties, today, increasing social tolerance, legal rights and advances in reproductive technologies appear to have pretty much marginalised or shut down queer political sentiments. And if we take a cultural moment now, in February, 24th of February this year, um, Britain became the first country in the world to legalise the use of DNA in three, parent, in three people um, configurations. Um, and this was done to cut down um, mitochondrial diseases. But in the clamour, the queer clamour that greeted this news, I, I actually found it just took me aback again. I don't know why I'm always taken aback, but I am, with the idea that three parent babies, because it was seen that this legislation would enable two mothers to have a real investment in the child. They would both be able to be real mothers. So that whole idea of gene mania, as you know, was talked about yesterday, it strikes again. And I think it shows us that it's the reminder of the double bind that contains us and how deep that discursive vein of bloodline really runs. So, thinking about why it's important for two mothers to be real mothers, why does it matter so much, why the rapture, and what gets left, lost in this genetic soup up here? And I can say with personal certainty that I think we're throwing out the queer baby with the amniotic bathwater. Because I want to suggest that in the investment in making babies renders effective ties second best. Nowhere in these responses was it about being able to love children, being able to care for them, being able to provide children with something which is interesting or perhaps nurturing. It was about investment in a blood sense, in having a genetic link. And we can see this in different ways with, you know, uh, um, egg donations, etc. And I'm not belittling those choices at all, but they are interesting. Because mothers and children are getting stuck together through a mixture of genetics, medico legal rights, and social cultural rules. And it's perhaps timely, therefore, to think again about what lies behind this reproductive imperative who's writing the story and who gets written out? And what is lost when privilege and prerogative of blood reign supreme? So, Liam, <laughs> he's now in his 20s. And he studied medicine at Cambridge in King's, and it should pass any day. And a couple of years ago, he called me, said, I think I need to drop out of university and start taking drugs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that phone call. <laughs> so the settling maternal intake of breath, where you go, any particular reason why? <laughs> <laughs> Trying not to react, because <laughs> you're taught that's what you should do. He says, I was reading this paper and it listed statistics and predicted outcomes for children who don't have a father, whose mothers have lived on welfare benefits and where there's been multiple partners. It didn't mention sexuality, but I'm sure it wouldn't have gone well. <laughs> I'm obviously not fulfilling my destiny. I'm doomed. <laughs> Laughter abounds. We laugh a lot together. We're very close. And the pride of a mother is evident in every pixel of this picture. And I'm not simply proud of his achievements, although they're obviously considerable. 
I'm proud of the young man that he is, and I love him for who he is, not the genes that we share. So to finish, Liam stands as testimony to the past generation. And during this time in the UK, there have undoubtedly been significant advancements in equality rights and positive social attitudinal changes. Today, choices abound, but class remained a determining factor, and money still talks. So the, the younger lesbian couple, when they talked about buy a house or have a child, they're difficult choices when you have no money, and sometimes there's no choice at all. Without, without social capital and educational resources, it's hard to navigate counter discourse. Parenting and couple narratives are becoming more tightly bound. Queers who want to go against the grain are free to do so, but ideas of cult compulsory coupledom render non dyadic configurations transgressive. And when Jeff Weeks talks about the world we have won, I want to suggest that maybe it's not first prize. And the fight, and there certainly is still a fight, is not over. It's absolutely chilling that the young couples in enduring love studies, so the study done now, it was the young couples who said they wouldn't hold hands in public for fear of reprisal. We think about the young people who are taking their lives, we think about the people who are killed in the UK. And only this week, in the wonderful paper, but with a massive circulation, the Daily Mail, mm -hmm. odious creature Richard Littlejohn said, if LGBT parents are a family, he's a Nigerian lesbian. <laughs> and that doesn't sound very tolerant to me, at 86% at the top of the rankings. But more than this, my sense is that in the midst of assisted reproductive technologies and social and medical legal rights, we're losing sight of the sticky stuff that really counts. Blood and genes surge over love and emotions. The richness of queer lives, yesterday, today and tomorrow, is erased in that reproductive imperative. There have indeed been clear advances across much of Europe in terms of LGBTQ rights over the past 25 years, but we should be wary of conflating temporal progression, progressive rights and narratives of progress. Time may march forward, rights may be progressive, but rights, wrongs and rules are not mutually exclusive. <coughs> Queer kinship has the capacity to be more radical than any advance in reproductive technology or legal partnership rights. The focus of this paper on moments and undoing acknowledges that who we are and where we start from shapes the field of vision. I maintain, therefore, that our task in researching queer kinship is not to write a new pretended families and to reown that, uh, reclaim that, obviously, because that may raise relationship diversity and smooth over the ruptures that shape us, but to own and tease apart how we navigate and redefine the rights, rules and wrongs of our diverse relationship landscapes. So to think again about the ways that blood, genes, inheritance, descent and reproductive biology, to quote Sarah Franklin, are being invoked in how we understand and research queer kinship. inviting me and hosting me and preparing everything so beautifully. Um, so, queer kinship. In one of the scenes in Francois Lozon's film, Photo de Famille, the protagonist shoots his family and then arranges the bodies on the sofa, posing for a family portrait or a family shot, if you like. The fatal shooting can be read, argues Jacques duly as a destruction of the family, as well as its conventional presentation to the public. This problematization of the distinction between private and public, respectable and scandalous, normative and deviant, constructive and destructive, will serve me as my analytical vantage point for discussing queer kinship and some longings that are attached to it. 
building on our 23 in-depth and open-ended interviews with Jewish Israeli lesbians, I will engage with another form of shooting the family, namely the dissolution of lesbian relationships and the stories about them. In what follows, I discuss how lesbian constructs stories of relational failures and intimate dramas in an era of compulsory happiness where one can be gay without being tragic and where one may belong, but only by erasing all traces of grief as Heather Love and Sarah Ahmed maintain. And so I ask how belonging is negotiated and worked out once life stories cannot adhere to normative convictions of family, such as respectability and stability on the one hand, and normative convictions of storytelling and presenting oneself in public, such as that of progress and redemption storylines on the other. Just a few words of contextualization. In the Israeli context, kinship is belonging. As Sylvia fogel bijawi argues, Israeli familism, that is the centrality of the normative family in private and public life, continues to be produced and reproduced daily as the foundation of the social order and as a national asset. Families in Israel are more stable than in most industrialized countries and tend to remain in close contact with their extended kin. Divorce is perceived as failure or unwelcome deviation that requires therapeutic intervention. Hence, despite the frailty of the postmodern family and its dependence on its members' willingness to stay together, the family is a central constituent of the ideological and institutional mechanism of the state and is produced and reproduced through the centrality of heterosexual marriage according to orthodox matrimonial law by the enhancement of the birth rate as a strategic national objective of the Jewish state, by gender inequality in the job market, and by welfare regulations, which create a correlation between divorce and poverty, especially in the case of women-headed families. Furthermore, penetrative inquiries regarding one's relational status or expressed wishes for speedy recovery from signalhood are part of the discursive mechanisms of familism and its regulatory power, emphasized in everyday interactions. The pressure to address in public one's own relational status is intense and the single woman is constantly being asked whether she is still single or being bid to get married next or soon. In the words of Kinneret Lahad. Take wedding for example. In Jewish Israeli culture, the most common response to a single person who congratulates a newly married couple or their kin is Bekarovetz Lech, which means soon at yours. A blessing that turns coupledom into a collective project, or at least a legitimate collective concern. It is not surprising then that the Israeli LBGT institutional politics feature their family as the category and root for belonging. As Ayal Gross asserts, it identifies civil rights with access to heteronormative family rights and constitutes claims for equal citizenship based on assimilation to the heteronormative family model. Those values include endurance, which, according to Kat Weston and David Schneider, is among, is among the most prominent values of kinship and which forms the ideology of authenticity, linking authenticity not only to biology, but also to duration. This means, among other things, that in addition to shooting the family, lesbian, lesbian separation also shoots any possibility for access to what Jasbir Puar defines as exceptional belonging, namely the institutional construction and proliferation of heteronormative modes of queerness, which are regarded as exceptional components of the nation, and through which queers gain limited access to partial civil rights, recognition, and belonging. As Ruti Kaddish maintains, by focusing on soldiers and mothers, gay struggle for equality in Israel have preserved rather than challenged the existing social order and institutions that lie at the center of the Zionist national ethos. Since lesbian separation does not adhere to neoliberal convictions of management of life, identified by Jack Halberstam as the conventional logic of temporality marked by birth, marriage, and reproduction, with death as the only exit point for marriage, it offers a productive site for exploring the convergence and transformation of that which is queer with that which is family. 
demarcated by one of my interview partners as the power that bends versus the powers that split, lesbian kinship is articulated primarily as a desire. And I quote from an interview, if all the, power, if all the powers that are exercised over a heterosexual couple push towards staying together, I think the powers exercised over us are reversed. I mean, these are powers that split. With a heterosexual couple, everything pulls toward being together and towards taking vows in the presence of a large audience. That is the reason why it is not so easy to dissolve the relationship, especially when the external <coughs> environment is extremely involved and when the mother-in-law says, why and why don't you give it a try? And we went through similar things and the children on the one hand, and the mortgage on the other, and the rabbi who got you married on yet another hand, end of quote. And from another interview, and then we married at the city hall, and I really felt all of a sudden the power of this whole thing called wedding. And we became a kind of an institution in our community, meaning something you can count on that will operate in a certain way, a kind of a project. For example, when we decided to have an open relationship, a friend told me, I'm not sure if it's a good idea. I really love your relationship, and it is very important for me that it lives on. <laughs> Between the powers that bind and the powers that split, the desire for the family is also the desire for the public. This convergence of ritual, institutional, and emotional practices, where mother-in-law is emblematic of recognition and support, is foreign to lesbian lives. Yet even in the context of domestic bliss, separation haunts the collective consciousness. This turns queer family into an ambiguous position, as lesbian relationships are experienced through different mechanisms of silences and hierarchization, also named compartments by one of my interview partners. Compartmentalization relates to the repeated interruptions of lesbian relationships from the public. And I quote from an interview, my mom did not agree to visit the flat I shared with my girlfriend. Slowly, she did deal with it, although since we separated, she is completely euphoric." End of quote. Indeed, performing heteronormative kinship according to the neoliberal contract of recognition in exchange for assimilation does not necessarily materialize into inclusion and belonging. End of quote. And her parents, with all their antagonism towards our relationship, at the beginning, and their attempt to domesticate me, the Tunisian savage, to teach me things such as without even knowing my background, which did not matter to them because I was the Mizrahi. Uh, Mizrahi are the uh, Jews from descent of uh, Arab countries, um, as opposed to those coming from Europe or uh, global north countries. And there were also tensions in this context of class differences, like her parents somehow interfered in our decision to get married over silly things, really silly things, like something to do with her parents' family fortune and that we should make a contract, end of quote. Ironically, signing a contract as a strategy for legally affirming unrecognized forms of coupledom, the same strategy employed by LGBT through domestic partnership and alternative rituals, is used here by antagonistic parents who try to force upon a lesbian couple a legal contract to restrict and regulate their kinship while recognizing it as such. The antagonism towards the lesbian relationship is accompanied by the attempt to domesticate the Tunisian savage and the efforts to prevent the contamination of the white middle class Ashkenazi environment. In other words, domesticating, yes. Allowing access to the domestic, no. And while the desire for the public seems to require the establishment of a family as a project, a brand, and a site of blessing for others who come within its gates and powers, same-sex marriage is available only outside Israel. As in Israel, all marriages are conducted according to Orthodox law, either Jewish or any other of the 12 recognized religions. In the absence of rituals that organize life around matrimony, assert Lauren Berland and Michael Warner, Improvisation is necessary for the speech act of pledging. And I quote from an interview. We've been together a year now, and you know, I could already envisage my home, my kids, 
had their names already decided. We were still uncertain about a name for our first boy. I wanted David, and she wouldn't hear of it. So I already had a home, children, a woman. It's just that it would have taken a few years for it to materialize. A year later, we split up. End of quote. Reproduction is a powerful category in Israeli familism. Here it is employed as a rite of passage into commitment, a metonym for duration, a speech act that by rendering futurity elevates the relationship. The reprenarrativity in Michael Warner's words, or reproductive futurism as Lee Edelman defines it, is a performative speech act, a power that beams and that affirms the relationship as deserving to be publicly affirmed. These notions of stability, duration, and reproduction ratified the queer family as a family. Thus, queer family is not always already an oppositional discourse. It is an imitation of the invocation into marriage, a sort of, with this future, I de wed. In that sense, the concluding statement, a year later, we split up, is both poignant and ironic. Indeed, the domestication and assimilation of lesbian relationality seems to go completely off script. How do you say coupledom in the plural? asked one of my interview partners while trying to conjugate coupledom, a word that in Hebrew has no plural form. Queer family is also about the transformation of intimacy into a post-separation relationship, which is sometimes friendly and on other occasions quite dramatic or rather cold yet in both cases has the capacity to spread and include other relationships within its scope. This lingering lesbian separation produces duration, care, and endless opportunities to get involved with one's ex. And a quote from an interview. Since we're both members of the same LGBT organization, I told my ex, look, it's very simple. If I want to go to some activity, I'll just ask the group coordinator if you enrolled then you'll do the same, and this is how we avoid each other. And to this very day, it works exceptionally well. And there are also obvious things, like it's obvious that New Year's Eve is mine, and it's obvious that I come to the New Year's Eve party. I booked ahead of time. But then I miss the, great, the gay pride, which is a pity, because it's obvious that that is hers." End of quote. What seems to be interesting about lesbian separation is that whereas the narrators experienced lesbian coupledom and the imitation of normative protocols of intimacy through different mechanisms of exclusion, rejection, objection, and compartmentalization, it is the failure and public scandal which succeed in penetrating the public sphere, disturbing and gaining recognition. Dividing a shared public space into temporal units in the context of a community-based organization underlines what Davina Cooper frames as the displacement of caring and commitment to the organizational rather than relational side. Turning separation into a public affair, the two ex-lovers, as well as the coordinator, cooperate in this well-orchestrated dance, underscoring separation as an ongoing involvement, which penetrates, organizes, and bears consequences for the public. Articulated, by, art, articulated as the lesbian bat mitzvah, namely the Jewish rite of passage for girls, by one of my interview partners, lesbian separation is experienced as a common, communal, and public property, a predominant feature of lesbian lives and a central component of lesbian identity. This pervasiveness and persistence of separation has gained a folklor folkloristic-like dimension in the stories I have collected to the extent of becoming dis indistinguishable from both lesbianism and coupledom. And I quote, correct me if I'm wrong, but according to your experience, aren't lesbians those who separate and then after two hours get back together and separate and get back together again and date someone else and after two years are back again? That's the mess that's going on, end of quote. When I asked another interview partners, when does our separation begin and when does it end, she replied, my separation starts the minute I meet them. <laughs> Indeed, one of my interview partners named the unending quality of lesbian separation as a classic. Yet another used the term more or less separated and a third defined it as the first chapter of the saga, <clears throat> all in order to emphasize that, that lesbian separation is by no means a polarized, linear, progressive, or expiring event. Rather, 
It is an un undetermined position, a potentiality that awakens or is revis revisited and might spread and include other relationships within its scope. Lesbian separation and lesbian drama were used interchangeably as an idiom or a term which does not need further elaboration. Phrased as a grammatical construct state, lesbian separation implies causal and metonymic relation between that which is lesbian and that which is dramatic and doomed to fail. While still coded as a separation in an effort to illustrate transformation or a change, lesbian separation incorporates a set of guidelines which determine issues such as accountability, boundaries, ethics of shared spaces, and care on the one hand, and which enacts a series of dramas, a term used excessively by my interview partners on the other. It is important to stress that this feature of never-endingness and its amalgamation with relationality is not always already celebrated as a radical victory over heteronormative scripts of time and family. When it comes to separation, endurance <laughs> and permanence are rather unwelcomed. Thus, the desire for, for permanence collapses and is replaced by a desire for an ending that really ends the public scandal. And I quote from an interview. I sit at work, in front of the computer, preparing reports with watery eyes, crying, <coughs> thinking of her, going nuts, all day long googling lesbian separation, always looking to see who was there before, who went through this, whether, whether this will ever go away, it doesn't. Every time I encounter these pathetic messages on Google forums, it makes me want to completely detach myself from the lesbian community forever. End of quote. <laughs> Where never-ending separation is considered excessive or simply lesbian, succeeding in separation is considered normal, echoing hegemonic scripts of maturation, as asserted by Jacqueline Weinstock. Nevertheless, desiring an end as much as desiring endurance emphasizes that endurance and ending are not opposites, but rather an entanglement. Lesbian separation enforces lesbianism as an identity, articulating it as shared experience and a common practice. If compartmentalization is the technology of power that regulates queer kinship, then the never-ending and excessively dramatic separation is, literally, the backlash. Being demarcated as a property of lesbian identity, the lesbian drama is articulated as a collective experience and is a form of a public which produces a common emotional world that is available to those marked by a history of being treated in a generic way, to use Lauren Berlant's conceptualization of intimate publics. Curious about the scriptural nature of lesbian drama, I asked one of my interview partners, do lesbian experience separations that aren't lesbian separations? Because you mentioned lesbian separation a lot. She answered, no. Mm -hmm. I confirmed, so there's only lesbian separation. And she says, for lesbians? Yeah. <laughs> I persist, so there aren't separations that are not lesbian? She answers, not that I've noticed. So I ask her, can you define lesbian separation? And she elaborates, making scenes, really just making scenes, they, lesbians, somehow return to puberty. And that which looks tolerable at 15 looks ridiculous at 30. I mean, enough lady, didn't you commit suicide when you were 15? Enough. <laughs> it's pathetic already. Lesbian separation is one long separation that continues and continues and continues and continues. <laughs> End of quote. <laughs> Produced as a lesbian regularity, excess and drama, from the meta-narrative of lesbian relationality. The fact that a group identity is constituted, claimed Lisa Baritzer, enables its members to become a multitude that makes a political deformation of public space. Employing a sitcom-like style and stigmatized identity, the separation narratives make room for another kind of story. Instead of indexing histories of affirmation, this shift slipped away from the linear and causal progress, leading from past to present and from visibility, invisibility to visibility, thus underdoing, undoing the logic of recognition as maintained by David Ann. By generalizing their experiences as lesbian, my interview partners relate to and generate a public, coined by Berland as the female complaint, 
This public is created by the circulation of intimate failure narratives and representations that express commonalities and likeness based on shared histories and lived experiences. This form of belonging is by no means an assimilative project, a project of institutionalizing the deviant relationality, forging acceptance or acquiring respectability. Rather, as Berlant argues, such an intimately disappointed public is a world of strangers who are emotionally literate in each other's experiences of power, intimacy, desire, discontent, and longing for reciprocity with the world. This belonging is claimed through the production of a generality among women or among lesbians in the case of this research. Constituting it as a group identity enables its members to occupy public spaces in the generic to mass as A, as Lisa Baritzer argues. What happens then, asked Lauren Berland, to encounters and attachments that have no canon? To use Anne Svetkovich's words, the interviews jolted me out of my customer response. In addition to, stay, to straying from conventional scripts of storytelling, the stories bend down under the weight of stigma. Whatever went wrong was identified as lesbian. The lesbian drama, the lesbian tel telenovela, the fucked up lesbian character, the naturally complicated and very obsessive lesbian relationship, and so on. The stories confronted me with abjection and shame of everyday lesbian existence. All my interview partners, as well as many of my lesbian friends, used the epithet lesbian <coughs> occasionally as the explanatory means, the etiology and instigator of whatever was faulty and impaired, as well as worthy and admirable in lesbian relationship. In the following excerpt, one of my interview partners emphasizes how relational failure is not merely a representation to be read or interpreted or a feeling to be processed and reflected upon. Rather, it has the capacity for materializing. And I quote, maybe it's our character. There's something about the character of lesbian women because we're different. Something in our character is fucked up. Forgive me for talking like this. I'm depressing you, aren't I? I reply in a depressed tone, no, you're not saying anything that I haven't heard before. <laughs> so she says, ah, okay, fine, good. It's good that you said that because sometimes I think I'm the only one thinking these things, end of quote. Indeed, it is through the construction of the lesbian that the narrators are able to affiliate and produce a queer belonging. As Berlant asserts, this intimate public is a sphere in which the personal is refracted to the general, a place for recognition and reflection, a place where emotional contact is made, a scene of identification between strangers that provide a certain experiences of belonging, conf confirmation, consolation, discipline, and discussion about how to live as a lesbian. Existing empirical research on LGBT relationship dissolution, which is not extensive to begin with, examines the failure of LGBT couples to endure within relationship, pointing to the hostile social fabric, discrimination, and the lack of institutional recognition and support. This, is, this epistemological position does not criticize the hegemonic values that signify separation as a failure that requires justification such as homophobia as the cause for the lack of the endurance of LGBT relationship. If it constructs homophobia and objection of LGBT relation relationality as external injuries inflicted on gays, preventing us from enduring and, as such, from belonging. This led me to a somewhat precarious epistemological position in my project. While not wishing to reduce the explanatory power of homophobia, recognizing the cost of departure from the norm, and the manner in which heteronormative, homonormative, and homonationalist politics produce the queer as a subject that should exceed in order to succeed, I also did not wish to validate the scriptural nature of lesbian separation. I wanted to explore public articulation of wounds, as Anne Svetkovich puts it, to ask about the implications of being at odds with normalcy, but not by merely turning to homophobia as the source, pointing to the problem and calling it a day by looking at either identity or the state as means for the resolution of trauma. My insistence to work with damage 
enables me to map alternative belonging and forms of public and provide the opportunity to investigate how injury and belonging are not simply oppositions, but rather an entanglement. It is a form of belonging that can be claimed through the production of a generality and self-inflicted violence as a form of connectivity, <coughs> as the Kunzmann emphasizes. Put simple, my analysis is not about why we lesbians tend to separate. It is about the culture and politics that this question reflects. Against the backdrop of inquiry that investigates why we cannot survive in our relationships, I propose an inquiry that takes this as a vantage point from which to explore the implications and potential of damage and failure, those inflicted on us and those inflicted by us on belonging. Thank you. also that uh, those two presentations really uh, fit together. <laughs> we were not sure when we better, you know, uh, uh, read your abstract, but we thought it might be so. Uh, and I was thinking, uh, 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 it came across uh, also yesterday, uh, how, uh, because you talk a lot how context shapes also our experiences. Basically, that's, we all think that we are free and we have choice, but basically you are so uh, sometimes uh, prevented from doing something by context. So I was thinking, uh, how do you think, in which direction does it go? Or how, how you could uh, say, uh, uh, oh, what would be the way to avoid all those mistakes we talked about? I don't know if they're mistakes. <laughs> of failures, I don't know. But failures in terms of, for instance, this genomania we face nowadays, and, and uh, this forceful couple from uh, mm. you, you said uh, yesterday. I mean, I suppose for me, it's it's just that idea of unsettling all of those taken for granted. It's like. A lot of people in this room might just take for granted that people have babies. You know, most families are creative from having babies. Well, what if you don't start from that starting point? What if you start from divorce as the starting point to look at relationships? What if you think couples aren't about two people? They're about something completely separate. So it's just saying, what if you start from a different place? And I suppose, I suppose my... my, um, my my sort of provocation, in a way, is just maybe as queer researchers, we, we need to, to be slightly less um, orthodox and, and traditional in the way that we actually are approaching research, because it might be that we're actually replicating things that aren't there when you actually look beneath the surface. So once you peel back the layers of data, once you look at the complexities of lives, I don't think you get coupledom. I actually think you get diverse couple relationships. I don't think you get mothers simply having babies. I think you get children being raised by people in lots of different contexts. So I think there's lots of ways of doing that in terms of different search questions about multiple situated standpoints of where you come from in your research. I think there's lots of ways of doing it. And I think it is, as you say, being aware of, of where those research points happen, both in the temporal sense of the times, so 
it was interesting to me to look back at data over 25 years, because actually if we start from today, you'd think none of those things ever happened. You know, it's hard to imagine Vicky today in the UK. It's hard to imagine the, the separatist rhetoric today. So it's putting that time perspective, but it's also putting that socio-legal and the medical perspectives. So what I take for granted in my context is very difficult, different to what you might or you might take for granted. And I don't know how you do that in one sense as a sociologist because we're so grounded in our field, our site. So it's, you know, I'm looking at the UK, therefore I look at the UK. But it is saying, well, what if we don't take that for granted, I think. Well, actually, I mean, this project uh, was conceived out of hostility of, um, towards what seemed to be a progress storyline also of the uh, gay uh, uh, struggle for recognition. And it seemed to me that there are a lot of stories, including my story, that just doesn't adhere. And I kind of had the same feeling also in regards to feminist struggles that really started with this notion of intimate citizenship, right? I mean, this Ken Plummer's uh, beautiful articulation of what happens when we use our narratives, either rape narratives or coming out narratives, in order to claim rights and, and full citizenship, which was, uh, I think, uh, uh, a crucial moment in activism. But, but nowadays, I mean, I feel that this is not, it's hardly enough. Because, I mean, we got to a certain point and what happened is that many kind of lives and stories just were left out of this kind of citizenship. And my, 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 my project started with, okay, so what's next? And what about us? And this frustration that the way we kind of conceive empowerment and voice, right? And all these kind of really, really important categories uh, uh, that were used for many years, both by feminist and, and LGBT uh, 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 political activism, are nowadays hardly enough. Okay, so we have the voice, and we are empowered, and 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 and, and I, I I mean I don't know. I, I'm not sure I have this kind of coherent vision, but recently, together with a few. Uh, uh, friends, activists and scholars, um, we started uh, a group in order to discuss uh, notions of uh, a state of emergency and crisis uh, just to try to contemplate current state of affairs in, outside this, I don't know, normative conceptualization of norm and rights, which just, I don't know, it kind of does not work, and just to try to conceive politics in other ways, right, which are more, I don't know, urgent, uh, which kind of looks at vulner vulnerable lives that just are not included in, I don't know, these progress narratives. Um, so I guess, I don't know, I would be happy in a couple of years to return with <laughs> conclusions about this, try, this, this effort to, to think in other categories. Yeah. Mm. Did you? Yeah, I see you. Next. Yeah. Uh, I appreciate you both the papers very, very much. I enjoy them. Just sort of coming off of the, you know, whose stories get told and so forth, uh, I, I've had a project that overlaps very much with your own in certain ways, Jackie, and I really appreciate the things you're saying. I wonder at the end when you worry about, and I worry about it too, uh, about the biological narrative surging over the ones of love and affection. If there might not also be a problem that goes in the other direction. Um, I'm thinking in particular of the ways in which, as feminists, and even more so now as queers, we have discounted the biological to the point that we forget about the childless mothers that we started out with, whose children have now become our children. Mm. Okay? In the narratives of love and affection, we pick up other people's children and say biology doesn't count. Um, and so I, I worry about uh, the sort of occlusion of certain bio stories that it might be important to hang on to in certain ways. Um, yeah. Uh, thank you both for those great papers. And I think it's really interesting where both of you at one point touched on how 
stable relationships in, in different ways, how stable relationships becomes this new obsession or, 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 or focus both of research, but particularly through particular generations. So I'm kind of interested whether you could both talk about generationality and whether you'd find it very different narratives coming from different generations. Um, uh, uh, around that, when I've done work on homophobic bullying, what became really remarked was how much of the LGBT literature on homophobic bullying was all about we must produce healthy children free of homophobia and the way we can prove that is their stable stability of their relationships. This almost tenacity of this, it does seem like an obsession with stability of relationships which seems to have forgotten how incredibly, it seems to be forgetting feminist history where in England we're coming up to the 50th anniversary of the Divorce Reform Act and it was the most, far more radical than gay marriage was divorce reform. And I think it's really important to try and remember how fantastically liberatory and something to celebrate is divorce. Can we, can, so can part of the politics be about celebrating perhaps the anniversaries in a lot of countries of divorce reform? <laughs> Carrying on from that, I'd like to know your thoughts then on what's just occurred in Ireland um, and how mm -hmm. with the narrative of celebrating same-sex marriage, there was quite, I don't know what happened here, but in Australia at least, people completely forgot that um, Ireland's divorce law is very restrictive right. in that separation, I think it's five years you must separate mm -hmm. for, and that they don't necessarily recognise overseas divorces mm -hmm. still. Um, and so people entering these new same-sex marriages are going to get into very restrictive. <laughs> <laughs> but people have sort of forgotten this and said Ireland's ahead of the times when really they're kind of very regressive in many ways. Yeah, Jennifer, um, so I just wanted to add to this these two questions that have come up about same-sex divorce, which is that now we've had 50 or 60 years of the evolution of heterosexual divorce and heterosexuals have uh, become accustomed to the expectations of divorce in particular when there's children. And same-sex couples have in a parallel fashion, create a lot of ways to minimize their relationships and their separations and their parenting. And now same-sex couples are required in, in the states in the US at least and in other countries where there's marriage and divorce, uh, to divorce to the, in the same fashion as heterosexual couples when culturally they have not had the 50 years of divorce law embedded in their expectations of how to divorce. Right? And so I'm wondering if that uh, elastic uh, separation is related to the marginalization of marriage in the first place and that the adaptation to uh, modern expectations of divorce, what, how you see that transition for same-sex couples? Um, or for queer, for the whole, the whole age. So I just will give you an <laughs> processing it. <laughs> um, I'll pull a couple of those together in a Really interesting way, or I hope it is, um, about retaining bio narratives or thinking about where bio, bio narratives fit still and thinking about divorce. And if we put those two things together, because part of what you do when you do papers is you cut loads out. And one of the, the, the instances I was talking about was when you're sitting in a barrister's office and suddenly your child, my child, didn't conceive, suddenly that's when biology counts. <laughs> when it comes down to money, when it comes down to legal rights, when it comes down to ownership. And I wonder actually if, um, I was just mentioning to Ruth earlier, um, if you start at the point of divorce to analyse relationships and to analyse what really counts, that's actually a really good place to start. And I know Vic is going to talk about that as, as well. It, it's just, actually is that where we're now having an interesting point to reflect back on where we are and where different narratives come to the fore and have different levels of meaning. Because I think it is, actually, because I, I do agree in, in the sort of the, what we're calling the rush to the altar, um, and, and it is a phenomenal amount of people in the UK are, are civilly partnering and um, are then converting those to marriages or just, you know, I've waited 27 years, therefore I'm now going to get married because I've been waiting for that moment. What that actually means, you know, what that really means, because there aren't scripts of how to do queer divorce. Um, you know, it's interesting when you're talking about lesbian separations being different and not when you're sitting in a barrister's office. I, I don't see much difference at all. I, I think they're actually remarkably similar um, about 
all of those different legal rights and wrongs and, and the sort of the and the by narratives I've said that might come into that. So that's one thing I think which which might be interesting, which pulls a couple of those together. I don't know if you want to reflect a bit more on that in terms of divorce. Yeah, I mean actually it's interesting because I mean when I speak to uh, heterosexual audiences then there will always be this person, this woman who would say, you know, it's not different from me as a straight woman. And I don't think it's essentially, you know, different. What is different is that you will never hear a straight woman say, I'm such a fucked up straight, right? <laughs> and, 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 I, that, and I insist, as much as I still insist on gender, also on sexuality as an analytical category that we must consider, because this is kind of a pool that we can always go back to, of objection, of shame, of being, you know, uh, stigmatized, self-stigmatized. And if we think about this project of belonging, uh, which, I don't know, it, it goes together, unfortunately, with assimilation, then the whole project is of what Leo Berzani called de gaying right? But unfortunately, when something goes wrong, then gayness is ready there in order to, you know, to be this kind of a, a, a source uh, uh, for becoming again deviant. And in that sense, in those moments, also in school, also, I mean, you were speaking about your uh, experience as a mother, and, you know, I, have, I can write a book about, you know, the interactions with <laughs> school teachers and nurses and, you know, these institutions uh, as, as a lesbian. And since I used to be married, many, many years ago, I could actually see, like, really, how, how it is different for me to approach institutions when I'm a lesbian, and, or even a divorced woman in Israel, uh, 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 and how different it is from just coming with this, uh, I don't know, almost automatic privilege sense of, you know, and a sense of entitlement when I, you know, I, the, the kind of, 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 of uh, I don't know, uh, uh, negotiations I permit myself to do uh, in either position, which is really, really weird to think of because in any other sense, I'm a privileged woman in Israel. I'm Jew, I'm white, middle class, educated. Yes, I have this kind of, uh, 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 all these right properties. And what happens when sexuality goes in? Um, but, I mean, it's interesting, the question about Ireland, because, um, I mean, Ireland, right, it's the place where you can get married but can't have an abortion. And, I mean, <laughs> if, if that is not, like, a crucial point about what is it that we're doing here in gay politics today, then I don't know what it is, right? I mean, and we can put inside this, uh, 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 I mean, surrogacy uh, uh, used now by uh, gay men in order to... Uh, to uh, 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 experience biological fatherhood, right? I mean, of this third world uh, uh, gay surrogacy, uh, 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 which is also kind of, I mean, in Israel we have these uh, clashes between fem feminist and gay activists, and gay activists are, you know, coming to us and saying, you should understand better than anyone else what it means to us to be, I mean, the right to the family. And this right to the family is implicated in, <laughs> you know, in, I don't know, infringements of, um, at least for me as a feminist, of, of at least questions about, you know, rights of, of, of global South women uh, uh, and reproduction. And so, I don't know, I mean, there were a lot of questions that I, I don't recall each and every one of them. I think, the, them, the, but stable, I think this the stable relationships one is an interesting one as well, and, and it sort of links to that as well. Uh, Daniel's question about, and maybe back to Johannes as well, um, the, the last project I did, the Enduring Love project, was it received large sums of money and um, it was funded to look at how couples sustain long-term relationships, which sounded about as normative as you can possibly get. And that was very intentional um, because we wanted the money. Um, <laughs> but also because I wanted, I really genuinely wanted to unpick what that means because I think when we think about long-term relationships and when we think about you know, the rush to the altar or couple done, there's an idea that this thing called the couple exists, or what we all think of as long-term relationships exist, and, and those binaries about you know the the um, parenting, non-parenting, or queer or straight, and all of those things exist. And and what we did in the in the project, and I think what's interesting for me is you start from the place of couple diversity. There's no such thing as a couple. I don't understand what people mean when they say couples and the couple or coupledom. 
because actually each couple is unique through its biography, through, um, through the choices that we make, through our circumstances, through the context that we live in. And so there may be legal restraints, I completely accept that. But what we found is some of the queerest couples in that couple research project were straight. Some of the most normative were gay. Um, the, all of those categorical boundaries started to break down. Ideas of um, non-dyadic couple relationships. Well, why are we so focused on the only way to think about triads is sex? Actually, when you start to think about non-dyadic relationships, it's about... It could be pets, it can be friends, it can be God, it can be colleagues at work, it can be lovers, it can be so many different things. But once you say that, actually the couple just completely almost disassembles in your hands in a fantastically exciting, creative way. And for me, that's what our findings were from that project. And I suppose that's, that's the starting point as well. It's just saying, what if we start from mess, complexity and diversity and... We don't think about these, these big silos of like coupledom. Because when we talk about cons compulsory coupledom and the rush to the altar and, and all of these things as being, well, they, they restrict queer diversity. Maybe they do when we put them in those terms. But when we actually looked at how people live their lives, they're not doing that at all. And I think maybe part of the problem is us researching, truthfully, and that we actually shut down the diversity and the queerness and the creativity that is actually going on when you start to look at those everyday moments, when you start to look at the ordinariness of relationships, I actually think there's, there's a hell of a lot of potential there, an opportunity there. There may be choices that aren't open. There may be different things going on for different types of people in different situations, certainly in different places. But for me, that's, that's sort of where I, I fit with the, the couple. Perhaps I can just uh, add one sentence. I mean, uh, Janet Haley wrote many, many years ago uh, a paper um, where she described what, how, how I'm not sure I'm saying it correctly, the uh, civil union, French civil union, uh, Pact Civil, or I, I, don't, I don't recall the exact name, but how it evolved. And, and she, she, uh, she showed that it actually started as a contract that you, it, it, you could have like an ending date, like we're going to be a couple of family like uh, uh, until February 19, I don't know, 2016 uh, or something like that. And that it didn't conform to all these uh, uh, properties of uh, uh, cohabitation and shared economic independence and uh, dependency and, and, and or monogamy even. I mean, three people could actually enter to this, I don't know, kind of uh, union. Um, and then what happened, right? I mean, she describes how it <laughs> materialized into what we know now as a very normative kind of couple. But I do want to say something about vulnerability. I mean, I understand this rush to the altar. I mean, there's nothing more uh, 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 urgent than being able to, for example, make decision uh, for your partner if uh, he or she can't make decisions, for example, or whatever, right? I mean, so, I mean, I'm, I'm not condemning this. I, I completely relate to this, like it's it, in the most I don't know uh, 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 powerful way, right? Uh, it is a necessity. I just I, I'm just thinking of how it actually converges in um, continuing uh, 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 um, continuing stigmatization of other others, right? I mean, I just want to kind of be critical about it. Um, yeah. I think it's time to finish. Sorry. <laughs> and uh, let's discuss over coffee about everything. Thank you for this amazing you know, session and uh, yeah, let's have a break. Thank you.